I'm excited and I'm energized to see all these faces here today. I love Liberty Forum. I have to get the, get the winter doldrums out in February and it, it will make me feel like tomorrow is a new day and I need to get something important accomplished. About one year ago today, sounds a little distorted, is it too loud? About one year ago today, maybe not today, plus or minus, this month, I decided I was gonna make a 3D printer. I really wasn't interested in 3D printing, just saw it online, said, hmm, looks interesting, I could probably use it for my own purposes to make little electronic gadgets and related. About the same time I got my printer to start put, putting out pieces that look recognizable, I found out there was this group online called Defense Distributed, and they were releasing files for interesting devices, like this thing called the Liberator. Probably, maybe you saw it on the news. 3D printer weapon. By the way, I have some other little things that have been printed on my printer. The Feinstein 30 round defense distributed magazine. The AR-15 lower and grip. I'm gonna pass these around the audience. They're perfectly safe, they haven't been, there's no parts in them, just so you can see what it's like. So at about the same time that came out, I said, hmm, I wonder if my printer is capable of doing this. I really wasn't that interested in printing guns, but I said, I'm gonna try it. And I knew Porkfest was coming up. And uh, 24, two days approximately and 24 hours of printing later, the parts were completed for the Liberator, for this. And I was amazed because I couldn't believe that you could print a plastic spring that would have enough power to fire a, a, a primer, okay? But you can, and I built this nearly a year ago and it still works fine. And it was the first Liberator made in New Hampshire. Some people say it might be the first Liberator made in the wild. And I, it, it picture was taken two days after the files were released and they were put online by uh, some other members of the Free State Project and they gained a lot of traction really fast. And I'm thrilled to be here with this gentleman right here who is responsible for those files, uh, a self-described crypto anarchist who other people have called a gun nut, uh, a genius, a patriot, and a provocateur. Mr. Cody Wilson made it possible for all these files to be available to any one of us and he's someone who understands that an idea whose time has come, which I love this phrase, cannot be stopped. So let's keep the ideas of liberty moving and let's give a warm welcome to Cody Wilson. Hey guys, thanks. So I, I think I should just use this mic, is that fine? Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me all right? Better. Thanks, yeah. Uh, hmm, there's a lot of things I want to say. I've never given a technical talk about um, the Liberator specifically, or e really even kind of our technical trials with Defense Distributed always lapses into philosophy or you know, political philosophy. So this is my first attempt at this. Um, this story is, has tried to be captured by Forbes and other people, but it's just kind of the, you know, the broad strokes. It was actually an extremely, as a libertarian audience might expect, an extremely difficult <laughs> and, and kind of like insane process because there were all these, you know, abstract regulations which didn't quite have um, uh, guidance written in the Code of Federal Regulations that we still had to somehow pretend that we were kind of uh, abiding by. I, no, I, I guess the first thing to say is Defense Distributed had been, had been prototyping, oh God, the lower receiver for our AR-15 since December of 2012. We had been releasing... Uh, other people's designs as well after Thingiverse.com, which is a, a popular repository for CAD files, had decided to kind of summarily take all these CAD files down. Um, perhaps this is part of the story that, that you might know if, if you know about our project. Um, but in the time between AR-15 and then AR-15 magazine development and Liberator trials, we had, already, we had already downloaded or released for download over like a million, we had served a million downloads, if you will. So it was like significant work before the Liberator had been done. And at that point, I thought it, w it was just so caustic and the stakes were so high and the kind of media anticipation was already there for this 
that the, the whole testing had to be done in secret um, from what I was already doing. So uh, the project lead was just took Liberator. Um, whereas with other projects we had, we had many CAD developers and designers from different states who would kind of collaborate on the same article. Uh, we took our best electrical engineer, who really had no ME experience, put him just on the Liberator. Uh, his name is John, uh, and he lives in Austin. And we tested at a, an actual separate testing location as well. And it's kind of funny to look at the server logs because it was like DOJ, DHS, uh, you know, New York State, NASA, everybody was just sitting on these servers. Uh, just kind of waiting because the rumor had kind of come out that the that this gun was being tested or or, or was intended to be released. And of course, this is like the the apex of the critical commentary, like in the comment sections of major articles, saying you know you can't print a plastic barrel, you know you can't print a plastic gun, um, which was of course like I mean that's the gauntlet that's being thrown down. So uh, I guess I guess what I want to I want to start with the technicals here. I don't mean to be like kind of boring about it, but uh, it's definitive. And then maybe question and answer will be like the best part. Um, and then maybe I'll say something about the name, uh, which is overlooked or, let's say, conflated into some, some other kind of message. Um, any like, critical remarks I'll have about the media re reception or kind of um, the activism endemic to this process or imminent to it, I guess I'll save for my, my talk tomorrow, which I invite you to attend. Um, the Liberator was actually designed in less than three weeks. So uh, the very, very biggest problem, the very biggest obstacle, the reason we hadn't begun doing prototyping before uh, the three weeks where we began the Liberator trials at the end of March, uh, was because we were just so constrained by what's called the Undetectable Firearms Act, which before December of 2013 was relatively unknown, uh, even to, to gunnies and to firearms people and to gunsmith. Uh, essentially that law says you can't uh, even prototype, you can't manufacture, possess, transfer, make, whatever, uh, a, a completely plastic gun. And the way they define it in the law is actually not just completely plastic, but it, uh, any, any gun that's ever created has to contain a certain kind of minimum amount of, uh, of metal to make it um, satisfactorily detectable. And um, this is actually a very difficult standard, and the Attorney General, well, first Treasury, but then the Attorney General, were supposed to promulgate regulations um, assisting gun manufacturers in, in how to uh, abide by this, this law. That never happened. Um, and as maybe some law students know, it's rare, but it's not uncommon that you can dive through a statute and not actually find the, the corresponding regulations. Um, so we kind of navigated through the maze for many months and then kind of just reached an empty room where they had forgot to fill in the blank, you know. Um, and this is actually common now, we're, we're beginning to find in, in all these different areas. Uh, so the biggest thing that we needed to do was, we thought, just have a kind of fiction, like a legal fiction. Well, we have a license from the government. Uh, to become manufacturers. And one of, the, one of the sections in this law was saying that, well, a manufacturer can at least prototype a plastic gun for purposes of testing whether the gun meets the standards in the law, one of these like circular uh, kind of reasonings. So if we could just become a kind of uh, you know, federal manufacturer with a, with a class two stamp, well, we were just testing for legality, Mr. Holder. You know, we just wanted to see. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to have the fiction in the back pocket. You know? my, my extreme fear, I mean, this is when, when Greenberg and other people finally came down to the to the warehouse to see what we had, I was like, look, our strategy is over compliant. You know, we wanted to be telling them about the law by the time they had kicked in the door. I don't know if that's realistic or not, and especially the, the way I'm critical of other people, uh, how they kind of um, bend the knee to the law. Maybe I should have been a bit more cavalier. And it would have been interesting to do this maybe in another legality or with another team of people in a different country, but uh, I, I thought there was also a kind of, I don't know, like a critical value in, in doing this and going to the extreme of doing it in the United States, where we know that the legal structure is just like, it's imperative is that you not do this. You know, only, a, only an insane person would attempt this within this kind of legal structure. Um, I'm getting a bit off topic. So basically, it was designed in three weeks. At the end of March uh, 2013, for one of those weeks, I was in New York at a conference where Avi Reichenthal of 3D Systems and a, a number of the kind of consensual capitalist players in, in the 3D uh, the 3D space were saying, oh, don't worry about the 3D gun. You know, it's not going to happen. It's not possible. Uh, and th this was like actually in the keynote, you know, and, and this was a kind of traveling prospectus, this conference series. It's called Inside 3D. I think it's still kind of ongoing. Um, where they kind of invite, um, oh, you know, the uninitiated capitalist who like wants to, oh, what, is 3D printing right for me? You know, like, uh, can I make some money on this? And um, basically the message there was, you know, they've, they've done as much as they're going to do. Uh, nothing else is going to happen. Well, that, the day before I got to New York, we had in the, um, in the kind of deserts of Lockhart, we had just tested our first Liberator barrel. And the way we did it, and this was, I think, maybe the critical move, because for many months we hadn't answered the question even to ourselves, can you print an all-plastic barrel uh, for a common gun with, with common firearms, like you know, ammunition commonly available? 
Uh, yeah, you can make a custom cartridge, but that's not as sexy as doing something around a 22 or a 38 or 45. Um, and that was, of course, like a very political and necessary question to ask. I mean, it's one thing to make a kind of gun in theory, but it's another thing to be like, look, I have a, I have a pistol that can shoot uh, 380. You have 380 in your garage. You know, this, this makes a very necessary kind of linkage. We had, we had registered a Remington 380 shotgun, uh, a, a small one, like a short barrel shotgun, as a Title II firearm some months earlier. And so we began replacing barrels on that 380 um, in, different, in different widths uh, and different kind of, um, different, with different radial prints. Um, and what we found was we thought, uh, the first strategy we thought was low chamber pressure. So we tried a 410 that the, that the, the, the Remington uh, 370 would shoot. Did I say 380? There's a lot of numbers. So. <laughs> Anyway, the, the idea was like, well, low chamber pressure, out, so that'll be the winning factor. And it didn't work that way. Um, the shot, uh, you know, the wad and the pellets and everything, they all kind of jammed up on each other, basically. This is to make it kind of the easiest to understand. There was this rush for each of the individual pellets to get out of the, uh, of the barrel, and the barrel exploded like a pipe bomb. Um, one of my first memories of the, of the Liberator like, barrel trials was that w when we stood there and we pulled the cord, we did a remote fire, because um, we're not insane. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I blew up a gun on my hand the other day. So <laughs> one of my first memories was that barrel just fucking exploding. I mean, and, and you know, it's like the sh you'll shoot your eye out thing from the Christmas story, <laughs> because I had only heard that for like a fucking year at that point, you know? <laughs> and you know, I was like, ah, the math, ah. Um, and I remember, you know, one of the pieces just sailing, I was just like, and that was probably like my lowest point in the, in the project because I'm like, yes, all right, because right. nothing even came close to the low chamber pressure of the 410. Um, so our next decision was, all right, it, it's not going to be a, uh, a shot shell. It's not going to be that. So we're not even going to try 12 gauge. Forget about that. Uh, we'll go to the 380. That was the only other thing we'd brought out that day. We had, we had printed two barrels in 380 just on the off chance that 410 didn't work. That's all we had planned for that day. Um, John slotted the barrel in. This was a kind of like a, a nine inch barrel, uh, longer, much longer than uh, the Liberator barrel. Um, and then we, yeah, we, we did the, the pull cord. John's brother out there was out there as well. And the way we, because the first one had exploded, we were all much further from the, <laughs> to the test gun that time. And um, he pulled it and we heard the crack and you know, like, uh, yeah, I think there was like the kind of spark of dust or something and it was like, you know, did it work? And everyone was kind of too far away to see, so we were all running toward it because, like, did the front of the barrel blow off or something? I didn't see any pieces. Did you see any pieces? And, uh, and we got up to it, and it was just like, oh, we have this on video, too. I don't, I don't know if it'll ever kind of come out. But we were all just screaming, like, holy fuck, you know? Like, oh, my God, and just jumping up and down. And, and again, like, to the liberal conscience, this is, you know, extremely terrifying and nothing worth celebrating, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> an extreme kind of, like, you know, technical demonstration for, you know, for the, the apocalypse, but <laughs> it was amazing, and it was like a, a real heightened moment of euphoria, because I knew everything would come. Even though we hadn't proved it out yet, I, I knew everything would come, because the plastic barrels work, and it was just kind of like, uh, oh, you know, just something you had to take for granted, that, that they wouldn't. I, and not only did they work, and this is the kind of, uh, the beautiful moment of the rest of that day, while the sun was setting, while we still had daylight, we just kept shooting bullets through that barrel. We wanted to see, okay, well, it works once. Uh, how many more times will it work? And the kind of like unbelievable answer uh, was that it worked five times and then six times. And we would just pull the, the cartridges out, stack them on this, on this wooden table uh, seven times, eight times, you know, and we'd go to the car. And at, at this point, the, the bore was expanding. And, and uh, this is the failure mode, by the way, of Liberator barrels, not brittle stress failure, but just expansion uh, of the bore. Um, we began to have to put tape in the bore because it was expanding too much, and then a little bit of motor oil to help with extraction. There's no good way of extracting a cartridge from a liberator. If you shot one, it's a, kind of a stressful thing. But, um, but then nine, and then 10, and then on 10, it, it cracked, but we were like, fuck it, you know, I think it can do one more. And, <laughs> and it did, so it, it did 11. And uh, we were like, wow, you know. Uh, I feel like, I thought I was gonna give you more technical stuff, but I feel like I'm giving you the emotional stuff. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, whatever. Um, and I, yeah, at that moment, it was just, it was all there. John's brother saw it, I saw it. And um, of course, we would keep coming back out because I, we, had, we had work to do. And, and at that point, I felt comfortable noti notifying the media. And this is a bit now into my media strategy. Um, even though the Liberator, by and large, as a prototype, wasn't finished, uh, I alerted uh, our confidant, Andy Greenberg at Forbes, uh, and the BBC. And I, I told them a date when they should be out in Austin. And I said, no matter what, I'm going to have it ready by then. 
Uh, of course, it's a total bluff, but I, at the moment it had to be. I want it to be May 1, May Day, you know, uh, to kind of <laughs> just to resurrect that little, some historical poetry, yeah? Couldn't quite make May Day. Um, we had some problems. John, John was at work a lot, uh, and we had, to, we had to settle how we were going to do the nail, but maybe some more technical things for you. Um, the springs for the Liberator. Uh, by the way, John didn't know Autodesk. Uh, he was an electrical engineer and not a material. He didn't have a materials background. And though his his job put him around a bunch of mechanical engineers who kind of helped him out with learning constraining and doing CAD and stuff, he never really knew CAD. Um, a lot of the guys that I had doing CAD work for us for these defense distributed receivers and magazines, uh, they were adept at SolidWorks, um, some of the, the other major kind of commercial suites because they were students in school and they could get you know cheap academic licenses. Uh, John didn't have any CAD and had never really used it. Uh, but because I just trusted his intuition so much, he was so educated and so committed. This guy is a guns guy, guns guy, you know what I mean? Like, uh, he carries everywhere. It has him just like in his car and like in his, everywhere he is, there's a gun kind of somewhere available, you know. Um, he taught himself how to do the Liberator as his kind of first CAD project. And I thought, though we didn't really emphasize it then, I think it is a testament to how easy this technology is to learn and to do, um, which is itself a kind of terrifying realization for the progressive kind of dependent upon the expensive assets of production, you know, and cultural production. No, anyone can download these softwares and familiarize himself with these, with the means of these production, um, you know, to their benefit. So one of the most difficult at the time aspects of uh, low-end 3D printing, printing a gun, was done by a novice, even though he had, you know, some educational advantage. The Liberator Springs were pillaged from a toy car on Thingiverse. We were looking at how to do a printed spring. It wouldn't be enough to do. We'd seen rubber band concepts and other things. That's just not enough. We wanted this gun to be, in a sense, uh, like a, in a black magic kind of way, uh, the way that these liberals were talking about 3D printing, creating you know, like the machine from nothing. Um, it couldn't have those kinds of like very visible seams, like uh, oh, rubber bands or something. Now, I know, granted, it, it has this, this nail, but somehow the nail, I don't know, it, it got past the, the liberal defense mechanism. And it's, it's kind of buried in the gun. You don't see it. Um, the machine, as you see the machine, is just fully fabricated out of, you know, whole stock out of plastic. And that is, that is it at its most kind of terrifying apogee, you know. Um, so the springs had to be plastic. And we didn't know it could work. And we had, we had help from a guy, Michael Guslick, other people who, had, who were collaborating a little bit on the outside. Michael Guslick, by the way, is the godfather of gun printing. Maybe in the questions we can, we can get to it. But we had thought for a long time, how, how are we going to control off uh, off-axis tensions in this spring. Um, we just wanted kind of X, Y, you know, we didn't want Z. Um, and then, uh, to John's credit, John found, um, and this speaks to the, tr the amount of garbage on Thingiverse, by the way. We, we went through all the springs on Thingiverse. We found one spring out of like all of them, which fit the bill. It was a radial spring. I, be I believe it's, um, the concept is Archimedes spiral. If you're familiar with some of these watch springs and radial springs, um, that was the concept. And so no, we didn't invent Archimedes spiral, but you know, we uh, appropriated it. Uh, uh, and of, since, of course, we've seen other people use this because it was amazing. These printed springs in ABS could hold uh, their tension and could hold it for a long time. We left, um, before, we, before we did a kind of aggregate prototype with printed springs, hammer, and all in the barrel, uh, we left those springs under tension uh, for like you know, five, six days, uh, just as strong as when we had first wound them after we'd printed them. Um, and of course, that, mess, that met the test. So even if maybe they kind of deformed or photodegraded or something, ABS doesn't photodegrade, but we, had, we were testing with SLA at the time, too. We knew that, like, all right, you could print this out, and at least for a week it would be good, fine, good enough. You know, there wasn't some kind of critical flaw in what we were doing that would somehow, like, subject it to an overwhelming or overdetermined amount of criticism. Um, the very final test was, OK, can you have a plastic firing pin, which can dent a metal, a metal primer in a, in a center fire cartridge? We thought about doing 22 rimfire, but uh, the 380 worked in our barrel test, so we just went with 380 from there on out. Um, the answer, uh, as far as we saw, was no. Um, no matter how much force you put behind an ABS uh, plastic firing pin, uh, the hardness wasn't there. All right, so it wasn't about, uh, I believe hardness was the only factor. It just wasn't hard enough to, to kind of make that dent in that primer. So we thought about, okay, ceramic, do you want a ceramic? No, we didn't want a multi-material gun. We thought in the end, all right, go back to the political nature of this project. It has to be something that would otherwise be innocuous and kind of unbannable or, you know, like not a specialty item or material. Uh, and so we went to the hardware store and found the most kind of like bland roofing nail, you know, <laughs> that you could find. And uh, I believe it was one of these, these Eagle one inch, 1.03 inch uh, roofing nails. And that was it. I mean, we, the, the only other questions were, all right, how tight does the compression fit need to be on the pins? Because I didn't want, I didn't want screws in the Liberator, at least in the commercial, not commercial, uh, 
public version of the library that we release. Um, I just want everything to be press fit and plastic. Um, and it to be white. I just remember at the time my obsession was, and by the way, my mental health was not great at this time because we had, it had been, <laughs> just saying, it was many, many months of doing this and you know, you, you kind of get blinders on when you're just, like, you've thrown yourself body and soul into something and I remember, you know, like John was sleeping on the floor at the time in the workshop. And by the way, this is like, this workshop is kind of like three of these panels. It's not a very big, I used to have a big workshop. No, this was a very, it's like a closet with a 3D printer in it. You know, it had no air conditioning and it was like, um, you know, late April of, of uh, 2013, it was getting hot, and uh, we were all just going a bit crazy. And but everything kind of ah, the very first time we, we aggregated and put it all together, we put it out on uh, on a test rig out at out at Lockhart at our kind of our Liberator testing grounds. Um, and by the way, I remember this: there was an undercover cop this whole period outside of my uh, apartment in a in a gray police car. I have no idea to this day. Uh, you know, we kind of waved once. I never asked him who sent him or why. Um, but during this period, there was an undercover cop outside my apartment. Not that that's kind of, you just, just color, details, you know. Uh, so, so we go to Lockhart, and we put it on the test rig. And this is, by the way, Andy Greenberg had come in, and it was like one day that I was like, no, I'm going to release this May 5th no matter what. I don't know why, but I was just dead. Like, it had to happen. I, we were so worried, I think, at the time. Uh, and we would have these late night conversations in a car. We would leave the phones, you know, like in the apartment. And, and we would go kind of out and talk. And we were just really worried. The, the number one concern we had is that, you know, they know, if they care, they know. And any day we could get a national security letter telling us to stop. Um, I wanted to put something out there. The minute it worked, you know, the kind of early and often open source idea. Uh, and then, you know, if it didn't, if we could modify it, well, we'd modify it while there was time. Um, we took it on this test rig, Liberator EXP001. Uh, and I brought Andy Greenberg out there. It was in the morning. It was like 7 a.m. in the morning, like some windy out at Lockhart, Texas, and bam, we pulled that thing, fired the first time. There was a kind of, we saw like the glow out the barrel and everything, and, uh, and Andy Greenberg was just like, you know, he, he didn't believe it. Um, and from that moment on, it was, it was like a race against the clock. So we didn't do any more remote testing. We had maybe remote tested the Liberator like three times before that, um, maybe twice. And, the thing I, I knew needed to happen, all I had was this idea, like there was this image that needed to be kind of broadcast, of not just it firing in a technical sense, like on a stand, but like someone holding it and shooting it. And, um, and it, was, it had to be me. Uh, so I had, I had the BBC set their cameras up, I had Andy set his camera up, and we had our defense distributed camera kind of all on the side on this little like, uh, one of these like ammo stands that you can have at these gun ranges. And, and I did it, you know, and John was like, hey, good luck, bud, you got brass balls, because, like, I wouldn't fucking shoot that yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but, you know, it had to happen. Like, here was the moment, you know. They, the BBC had flown out from London. I mean, like, you know, it's do or die. And, um, <laughs> you know, maybe die, but. <laughs> and, and that's it. I, and I pull in the, the moments online, and, and I encourage you to go see it. It's like, I, I think it betrays a certain kind of humanity to it. When I, I've tried often not to be a very human person in these, YouTube portrayals, but there's a bit of humanity to it, and I, I pull it, and, uh, and it does fire. Um, we had learned some things in the weeks after that, that in fact, uh, firing pins are quite fussy. If you don't have one that's very uh, concentric, like its concentricity isn't kind of just right, um, it'll strike low or high on the primer, and you, and you won't get a, a fire. And it was kind of a miracle that in all of that, that, that first critical week of testing with media and everything, they had not misfired, uh, because it, it kind of became... Um, well, you know, it's reputation that it was really fussy and, and wouldn't always fire for you, maybe only half the time. We worked a lot of that out, but like uh, just a few weeks ago, I had National Geographic down, and uh, for like an hour, we couldn't get it to, to fire for them. We finally did, but I mean, you know, it's, I, I was just, I thought, some kind of blessed moment, uh, like a, a divine, you know, it shot the first time I needed it to shoot when all the cameras were there. Um, I don't know how I am on time, but... Um, if there's like more technical things I can say, I, I wish to say them. So if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about printing a Liberator, a, a critical thing that's kind of left out of the conversation is uh, the acetone vapor treatment, which I think was novel for that application in Gunworks. People in, in 3D printing that were using ABS at the time um, had kind of demonstrated, especially in the hobby space, that if you use acetone vapor, you can smooth your prints down, um, and you can take layer edges and kind of like adhere them together, and, and you get a much more attractive print. Um, this is really useful, especially because Stratasys and other companies hold patents for like heated build chambers, which otherwise would really smooth out a print or kind of make it look a little bit better than what you have it, uh, available to you at your desktop. So uh, it ended up that with acetone treatment of these barrels, just the Liberator barrel, um, you could go from one round uh, through 
to these eight or nine that we were seeing. I mean, that was a very critical part of what we did. And if you're going to build one, use the acetone vapor. It's in the spec sheet, it's on the pirate bay, it's in the archive and everything, but um, you treat it, you, you boil the acetone or you have it vaporized, you treat it for like 20, 30 seconds. Uh, and then you wash it either in vinegar or water. And that's a critical, because you can't let it kind of stay beneath the layers of the plastic. It'll kind of make the, the barrel too brittle. Uh, and the barrel will explode if you shoot the gun, <laughs> which has happened to me. Um, but I've lived to tell about it, so. So I don't know, what's, what's more interesting or like the legality or the technical stuff about it? I guess another thing worth saying, I kind of said this last night, was there was a bit of like an agitprop moment on the part of the government um, where they used the Liberator as a football. When the ATF had published these videos of their own fire and technology branch testing the Liberator pistol, um, they include modified versions of our design and not original. And of course, this is not uh, a surprise to those in the gun making world. The, the firearms technology branch kind of famously will, is secretive and will modify your designs and then tell you, oh, by the way, your gun is a machine gun. You're like, what? No, I didn't design it to do that. You're like, oh, sorry, you know, you can't go to market with your gun. Um, and what they did for ours, and you can, you can see this. Thankfully, they've preserved the evidence on video, but they printed one liberator in a PLA plastic uh, because MakerBot and some of these other commercial printers um, they have offerings available in PLA plastic. Now, we print Liberators in ABS plastic. This is not a small distinction. Um, in fact, Liberator springs in PLA don't even function. They, they're too brittle. Uh, you can't even get a Liberator, even if you wanted to die and blow the gun up. You couldn't do it. Um, so <laughs> what, the ATF just, what the ATF did uh, was print an, uh, a PLA body and then modify They took the sidewalls off and put in modified springs. I don't know how they did it. They seem to have, like, really stretch and widen the springs. And I don't, I'm not sure if they're still in PLA. They might actually be like an epoxy spring that just kind of matches the visual you know, milieu or whatever. And um, that modified gun, they shoot, and then they have it kind of you know, fragmented into a 1,000 pieces. And uh, it was this very visceral moment that they used to kind of help sell uh, the re-up of the Undetectable Firearms Act in December of, of last year. Not that we are surprised that our government would you know, throw propaganda at us, but it was an extremely propagandistic moment. And it, of course, depended, like, like the Waco trials, you know, 15 years before, it depended upon a public misapprehension or, uh, you know, um, unfamiliarity with the underlying technologies and, and specifications. So most people don't have 3D printers, most people don't care, most people don't make guns, you know, and so look, oh, it's dangerous, it's a lethal weapon, it explodes, there's no quality control. You know, it's all in service of a progressive idea of gun manufacture. Um, well, we need responsible manufacturers that license their products and perform them to government-mandated testing specifications, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, th I think, though, regardless, we've done critical damage um, to a couple, a couple different narratives. Um, one of them, a progressive narrative about what the future of manufacturing was and is. You know, the whole gun conversation after Sandy Hook depended upon an idea of registration. The familiar shit from the 90s, you know, registrations and these certain channels and constrained channels of, of production and, and, and commerce and background checks and this kind of linking with the public health issue. I mean, that, we exploded with this networked idea of, of manufacture, digital manufacture, network devices, you know, or tumultuous fall in the cost of the means of production. You know, all will be makers. Um, I, I think it did really irreparable harm, and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, yes, I'm, in, I'm currently like in, embroiled in this conflict, for lack of a better word, with the State Department. Um, I would want nothing more than to continue to publish and to aggregate uh, these files for these guns, these visible gun files for you, and, and to publish them. Now, some people kind of um, behind the scenes, pseudonymously, are continuing to do that. Um, and they are great people for doing that. But there's so much more we can do. I mean, the Liberator was the very first prototype of a certain kind of gun that we had done. And yes, it's an impractical device. But to give you a kind of you know, preview of things to come, I mean, we were experimenting with centering in nylon 6 and nylon 12. Not that these are dramatically better in material uh, properties than, than the Liberator, but they're so much more interesting and can do just different things. And of course, there have been announcements for, for desktop printers like the Mark I, of which Defense Distributed has acquired uh, a developer kit, uh, at least pre-order, that prints in carbon fiber, which of course has similar material properties to aluminum. Uh, at least in its, you know, tensile strength and, and other kinds of, like, impact strength. So, I mean, we're going to have, uh, we're on the cusp of having immediately, not just these technical proofs of the future that we imagine, but, like, literally the kind of immediate instantiation of the future we imagine. And, and what's so much more beautiful to me is that a, a fully carbon fiber liberator or some you know, variant of that remains undetectable by metal detector. <laughs> 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 That's a bonus. So, uh, <laughs>
I guess a point on that. Yeah, this was supposed to be a technical talk, but here we are. So a point on that. There was this kind of like grand conflation with detectability versus observability. And the conversation I wanted Defense Distributed to have, and I think by and large successfully did have, was one about power and observability and the kind of grand bureaucratic regulatory imagination uh, that all things will be known and seen uh, and kind of, um, oh, you know, the prior approval, uh, you know, grand diktat. So uh, like in California, there's this idea now that, uh, oh, don't, don't you know? Some people can create guns without first the approval of the Department of Justice. You know, they should, these ghost guns can kind of come out, as it were, out of nowhere. We don't know who makes them. <laughs> ghost guns, you know, look it up. It's a, it's a real concept. Ghost gun stories, you know. Uh, no, no, I've had so much fun with the kind of like phantasmic na nature of this. But I, I do believe there's actually a kind of, um, there's more to write there. Maybe, oh, I have a book. If you read the book, maybe it'll be in the book. Um, so. The idea there was, well, of course, you'll just write into justice, and justice, because you know, justice is all about being responsible about who gets guns and where they get them from. Eric Kohler, you know, is really on the ball about who gets those guns. Um, so you know, they'll send you a serial number. Oh, and then you have the kind of you know the grant of, of privilege from the state to go ahead and manufacture your firearm. Ah, you know. Um, and then Steve Israel had kind of Steve Israel, and then Chuck Schumer were the, the New York kind of delegation, successfully gin the issue up into, well, uh, these things are detecting, or defeating modern imaging. Um, therefore, all guns must have a critical amount of metal in them, like the Undetectable Firearms Act suggested, but, ah, to go one step further, which was beautiful. I saw Think Progress and everyone kind of pile in on this one. There were certain critical pieces of a gun which must always be made of metal. Now, this is about, I mean, this is extremely dangerous, and I think uh, immediately uh, apprehensible or a apprehendable by the libertarian imagination. This is a... a a dire effort to constrain the development of a particular technology. Not just to constrain it, but to stratify it, right? Um, to keep it stratified. All guns and their critical components must be metal. Well, why is that? You know. Um, and the critical remarks can go one or two removes further. Um, but that was, an in, that was an intention, a direct intention expressed to preserve the current state of three, uh, uh, firearms technology where it was. Um, which is the progressive agenda, the paradigm of government, um, beyond generalized security, this, this dissuasion of the event, if you will, right? This prevention uh, of the kind of uh, overwhelming flow of uh, events and technology. Um, and I guess, I, I don't know where I am on time, but I want to open it up to questions, so um, I will. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so FFL is a federal firearms license. He's asking, did I get an FFL so we could participate in commerce? No, actually. Uh, it's just that a nonprofit company can't also be an FFL holder. You have to um, act like you're a business. And you, uh, so I actually had to create a subsidiary and register that subsidiary as an FFL. And of course, they, on the ATF, on the phone with me, was like, oh, we know what you're doing, you know, and you know a nonprofit can't have it. And I was like, no, 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 check the application. <laughs> you're like, I didn't apply as defense distributed, you know, you motherfuckers. And so. <laughs> But I'm, but I'm serious, you know. <laughs> it was a tense conversation. Of course, like, that, at every step, the, these, like, these little micro kind of aggressive encounters, it's like, you know, we know what you're doing. You know, stop. And I'm like, no, you know. <laughs> and so, no, uh, uh, there was this, I think Vice made a, a bigger deal of it. Uh, Aaron was like, uh, Aaron, the producer of that Vice documentary, if you saw it on, on Defense Distributed, was like, why, why are you getting FFL? And I was like, oh, Liberator Trials, you know, like, SOTs, you know, if we have this kind of, if we can make Title II firearms, Air Colder can't come arrest us, you know, we can prototype almost any kind of abstract gun technology. And she was like, yeah, but you can sell them too, right? I'm like, yeah, we can sell them. And have we today? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I think mostly it's because 3D printing, let's be honest, I'm not the biggest 3D printing evangelist, but 3D printing is not really a mass production technology. Um, I'm sure there's a price point I could set where it might be worth my time, but it's actually a bit higher than I'm sure anyone in this room would be willing to pay for some of these articles. Um, and then again, there was a, another effort in trying to protect ourselves from this kind of commercial talk, especially now that we're involved in this thing with the State Department. Traditional First Amendment claims, which are our primary claims uh, against this aggression from the State Department, we have a right to publish this information directly into the public domain without first seeking the prior approval of the government. This is, seems like standard First Amendment talk, right? Um, to make that claim the most effectively, we can't also be a commercial operation. Um, many people have tried to do that in the past. Commercial arms exporters say, well, I have a First Amendment right to share my manual with the French or to share my manual with South Africa. You know, and I go, eh, nah. <laughs> not so much. The Supreme Court says, well, you know, your speech doesn't rise to the level of protected speech. Your speech is commercial speech. So that was a, a, a kind of defense mechanism that I, I was at least prescient enough to see then uh, and I've tried to maintain now. Yeah. 
Oh, a microphone. So, I'm assuming most people in the room have not yet printed uh, <laughs> one of your guns. Surely not. Yeah. Uh, let's say we want to get started. What are the steps? What are the equipment? You know, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. A, a ballpark okay. of uh, prices. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't I should have said more of these things. I just I kind of lapse into just talking about the kind of more abstract things. The Liberator is printed on a Stratasys Dimension SST. Uh, it's a machine from 2005. It was like the uh, I think the first generation of its name. Uh, these printers have gone on to become the U-Print family of Stratasys printers. Um, there's a heated build chamber. I believe it's. 8x8x13 eight by eight by is the, the build volume. And um, it's as big as like a refrigerator. <laughs> I mean, it's like a big you know, printer. It's expensive. We bought on the secondary market. It was a little bit broken. We, we fixed some things on it. We bought on eBay uh, because maybe, as you, as you know, I couldn't really buy things from Stratasys because they have a habit of like not selling me things and taking things away from me. <laughs> uh, so uh, also, in, in servicing that printer, it was a, it was a, a shit show because um, we couldn't give any indication that we were defense distributed. So when we would have the strategist people come out and look at it, I did it through a surrogate, and I, I hid it in a different part of this warehouse. We were in, like, in, the, in an auto shop, and we kind of pretended that it was a, a car company. <laughs> you know? I mean, anything we could do to kind of... Um, all these little... Oh, God, man. It's like bringing it back. I hadn't even thought of it. So. I would recommend something with a heated build chamber, but I've seen people do uh, liberators on solid oodle printers. Uh, I've seen them do them on their own custom rigs, uh, like, like Bill did, who introduced me. Um, anything that can print ABS plastic. Don't kind of go out and get a, a, a new generation MakerBot, because it only prints in PLA, is my understanding. And um, I wouldn't recommend it. I guess the other critical things I should say is if you're really interested in printing a liberator, I, I think, again, I wouldn't recommend you doing kind of serious testing with it. Uh, but then again, if you're intrepid, you know. Um, but if you just kind of want to print one for yourself and do it uh, you know, to spec like, like Defense Distributed had done, find the archive on the Pirate Bay or, or somewhere else online, and, and it's kind of an exhaustive step-by-step -step, uh, instruction. Um, and we'll tell you the materials we use and the things that we can only recommend that you do because that's all we did. And I've only ever tested liberators, printed liberators, from old 3D systems, uh, SLA uh, epoxy resins, uh, and ABS plastic. So um, in many ways, uh, other people in the world have kind of probably tested far and beyond uh, what we have with, with liberators. I had to kind of stop using all of our money on materials because I, my legal bills were the very biggest and continue to be the, the kind of biggest part of defense distributing. Yeah. You've mentioned the thing with the State Department. Uh, I, could you give us any clue of what's going on with your legal stuff and yes. problems and yes. any comments or well, stories? For the very first time last weekend, I was at this conference in Arizona. It was the very first time I talked about it. I kind of, for many months, I didn't want to. I didn't want to say anything about it or what we had done or the legal team we had got together. I wanted to kind of preserve it as like a, at least a, oh, you know, for its explosive potentiality. Like people would tell each other about it when the time came when we needed to tell people. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm kind of going to keep some of that like uh, under under wraps. But to date, the State Department's actually sat on it, like. Okay, okay, let me, I'll go back. So the State Department issues me a letter, and for the very first time in American history, they, well, the history of export control law, whatever, um, they issue, they, they put in writing an express policy, which is, before you put this kind of technical data into the internet, onto the internet, this would require our permission. Uh, you didn't seek our permission. Please fill out, you know, this extremely large amount of paperwork called the commodity jurisdiction request about how you decided that you shouldn't ask our permission. <laughs> <laughs> I, and you have to have a sense of humor about it, you do, but um, I, thankfully I was able to lawyer up very quickly. I had made a number of connections in the months of, uh, of our kind of you know, heightened popularity and our, m our most productive work. Um, and that team, by and large, remains the same team. Um, and to date, I've been able to kind of shoulder the legal bills. But the State Department requests of us all of this information, uh, which is, of course, in this ironic like Kafkaesque sense, is the only way that they could even make a determination that we've kind of broken some law. So, we give them the kind of um, stuff of which they fabricate an, an ex post facto determination that there has been some kind of breach, you know, of um, you know, some legal taboo or something, uh, or a breach of what's called the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, a set of regulations which govern the Arms Export Control Act of whatever, 1978. One of the kind of interesting and Orwellian features about this set of laws is that since, I think, 1984, this law hasn't been updated to accommodate for the, the simple fact that there is a thing called the internet. <laughs> you know? um, it accounts for an idea of the public domain, which is like a very reductionist in scope. I mean, um, libraries and, and conferences and things. So if I came here and kind of passed out liberators, it might be a more interesting legal argument than if I had directly published into the, into the internet. So we're at the kind of um, 
nexus of a Cold War like legal structure, and then also you know the um, the 21st century structure of, of the freedom of, of information uh, and the internet. I'll say, I guess, maybe one more thing about all this, which is that, maybe I won't say it, actually. Now you have to say it. Well, you are claiming it's a freedom of speech to release these files. They're saying no need permission from us before you can talk. One of, the, one of the primary arguments we will make if we have to make them, because we're not even to, and you, you get the idea, uh, this is the kind of absurdity of the bureaucracy, we're only in the administrative matters right now. We're not even to the point where we can make a constitutional argument. You know, we have to kind of go through, this could be a multi-year thing, and I, and I regret that very much, which is why I've taken steps to kind of retool our operation. We're in a kind of stable zone right now, so we might begin printing again, even if we can't release the files, but yeah, state, state has basically said, and okay, this is a critical piece of information, you should probably know, I'll tell you now. Okay, you think you have the freedom to keep and bear arms, all right? And this is something, uh, especially a Second Amendment type, and I don't mean to generalize, you know, about people here, but uh, especially red state conservative type, you know, like that, I hold that near and dear to me. As long as I can hold the, you know, cold gun metal in my hands, you know, I, I have something very material, which is a confirmation to me that my firearms rights are preserved. Well, what you didn't know, <laughs> and what this case can eventually show, I, I hope on a, on a grand public way, through the New York Times, other things too, I mean, I'm working on it, is, um, is that this Cold War apparatus actually, uh, led by the DOD and, and now the DHS, uh, actually claimed for itself the right, the first kind of right, to all generated data, blueprints, technology related to munitions um, for itself. The United States actually claims prior ownership of all privately and publicly generated data, past and present, related to class one munitions up to 50 cal, beyond 50 cal, explosive devices. So though you might have the right to keep and bear arms, the smart ACLU liberal will tell you, well, you know, you, might, you don't necessarily have the right to buy them. You don't necessarily have the right to make them. You don't necessarily have the right to talk about making them. So now you know. <laughs> and of course, this is not just a, a theoretical argument. This is the argument currently being asserted by Obama's State Department. There was an ongoing arms export control reform initiative, which is, uh, as we know, reform initiatives go, had been going on for about two decades. And um, there was a rumor, you know, somewhere high up in some extra legal, you know, National Security Committee that they were going to take class one munitions these kind of common guns that we're at least still allowed to buy, they were going to take these guns and put them into the commercial classification of his scheme. And finally, there would be like a, a right for us to kind of have the information and trade the information for ourselves, you know, before there was some kind of, a, oh, you know, problematic constitutional issue. Well, no, it, it looks like because of defense distributed, it's going to be a problematic constitutional issue first. Um, you live in a state of unfreedom. Welcome to the world. Okay, uh, other questions? Yeah. So to most of us gun nuts out on the internet, the 22 long rifle yeah. seemed like the natural place where you were going to start. Yes. Could you speak to why you said you started with the center fire cartridges? I think yes. it was the 380. Why not start with the the much smaller chamber diameter and pressure of the 22 LR? I'll say I'll say a couple things about that. Uh, our very first defense distributed video, that god awful thing where I just talked for eight minutes about why I want to do it. I mean, I. Um, uh, 22 LR was the first thing we wanted to do, and it just seemed natural. Um, now, there is a kind of interesting anomaly in its chamber pressure, which can be like remarkably high for such a kind of you know, constrained caliber. Um, we ended up not doing any testing with it. It was just pure kind of happenstance. So we came out one day with a 410 test, and John had tested, uh, he'd actually printed some 380 barrels. It was literally the first thing that worked. The first break we had, we chased the break, you know, a kind of path of least resistance. Now. Um, there was a fulfillment of a kind of uh, 22 Liberator in this gun developed by a Canadian in the summer of, of last year. Uh, he called it the Grizzly. And if you, if you look for it, there's some critical links from Reason.com and some other places. It's basically a 22 Liberator carbine. It uses Liberator springs, a different barrel, a superior locking mechanism, actually. Um, an all-around better gun, and I, I think a more reliable gun, too. So. Um, 22 would have probably been the best thing to test uh, because it seems to work naturally and, and like a charm, especially for this guy. I think he tested like 30 or 50 in a row or something. Um, it just, that was our first prototype. And, you know, we were a victim of our own success because it was just this raucous media event in the UK and then the State Department came down on us before we could do anything else. Um, I hope that answers your question. Other, I don't mean to take up time. Do we have time? Okay, yeah. Could you comment on direct uh, metal laser sintering for 3D printing a metal gun from home? Yes, I can. Um, DMLS, direct metal laser sintering, requires metal powder uh, and uh, today an extremely expensive machine. 
And it was one of the first things in our research process. We were like, oh, well, why don't we just kind of cut to the chase and metal print a gun? Well, you can do that. But you can, you know, the question is, like, as Sal would, Sal would say, like, at what cost? Um, it would be extremely expensive. Um, there's, a, there's a group called Solid Concepts, which we actually share some kind of research staff with from time to time in Austin, Texas. They recently demonstrated the first 3D printed metal gun. I found it to be a, a counter-revolutionary demonstration for certain reasons because, one, they take a, they take a military pattern gun, uh, <laughs> and then two, they say, well, no, this is just a demonstration uh, of, of the achievements of high capital and technology. You know? I mean, uh, <laughs> It's like, no, we're just showing you what technology can do, you know? And like, they kind of divested um, as much as they could or distanced themselves or distantiated themselves right, from any political import that this demonstration might have had. Um, so I thought it was a very kind of, yeah, they wanted the publicity, but it was, it was a roundabout way. And, and I'll show you like the 3D printing community in its kind of um, undying fealty to or just this kind of scientific, progressive story of technology didn't include in its his, you know, 2013 list of notable achievements in 3D printing, it didn't include the Liberator, but it did include the DMLS pistol by solid concepts. Um, this is, a, this is a, a realistic, let's say, print, uh, print idea if you're a small commercial firm that really wants some metal prototyping or something, I mean, if you have the budget for it, but it's just not yet something that you can do in your garage at, at a reasonable, it doesn't scale down, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm sure it will to some degree, um, but kind of what's more exciting for me are these complex materials which mimic the material properties of metals, which are now presently available uh, and at much, you know, uh, orders of magnitude uh, lower in cost. Is that, a, I hope that was enough. Oh, and I'm done. Oh. So come to my next talk if you want. I'll be more angry or something. <laughs> <laughs>